I want to ask you uh, about a, a frame breaking thing. Now that you're, how long has it been since the Milk Road acquisition? Um, two months, maybe a month and a half, something like that. So you're still early into it. Um, this February 1st is technically my last day at HubSpot. That's two years. So, um, and so now I'm two years into it. And I wanted to ask you, and I have a list here, but I wanted to ask you, uh, because uh, I know that the guys running the Milk Road now or the owners are like recruiting interesting people because I like people like message me. They go, hey, this person's recruiting me. Should I join Milk yeah. Road? So like I'm getting all these like ass uh, like to, as your reference check. Um, <laughs> what have you learned so far about what it's like to be the founder of a company that's now owned by someone else? Is there anything interesting that you've learned? I have a, a, a list of a few things that are interesting to me, but is there anything you've learned? Uh, I feel like you got a more interesting answer than me, so you go. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things, and these are a bit frame-breaking. Um, and so the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think someone once said, like, or at least this attitude exists a lot in Silicon Valley, where they're like, what's your exit plan? And then everyone's like, fuck exit plans. Don't have an exit plan. Uh, you're not building things to sell. Great things get bought. They don't get sold or something like that. And I actually think that's nonsense. I actually think if you want, you can build a company where you're like, I'm going to exit in like four or six years or two years, and I'm going to make like tens of millions or hundreds of millions, whatever. Like you can build a company like that. And I think it could be really successful. Um, and so one of, of a couple frame breaking things that I had, the first one, building something from scratch is a very, very rare skill. And one or two focused entrepreneurs with close to no money can probably do more in six months than a 50-person team with millions of dollars in 12 months inside of a large organization. And that was actually really challenging to me. I remember when HubSpot said they wanted to buy us, and I'm like, dog, just launch your own thing. Like, I don't, why would you do, you know what I mean? And being in, at HubSpot now for two years, I see it's really hard. The reason it's really hard is the creative types who are, who are bold enough to go and build something, they either aren't working at that company because they're out doing their own thing, or they're just stuck in this political game where they want to impress their boss. And it's not because a company's bad. It's just this is the natural thing. They don't want to embarrass themselves. They don't have a significant amount of upside to see the win. They don't get the dopamine rush of the sale coming into Shopify. And it's actually really, really, really hard to build something from scratch. And so it's worth it to them just to buy something that's already working. Do you agree with that? 100%. Um, and you can see it when an acquisition happens, the velocity of progress slows down like molasses it is uh it's, it's like kind of remarkable now that doesn't mean it fails but the velocity definitely slows down other things go better but the velocity and the pace and the sort of like um yeah the aggression and productivity i think go down and that's what i describe as anxiety goes way down as an entrepreneur your anxiety goes way down your frustration way up that's the trade-off that you're going to make however this is another thing where I made this mistake where I would dismiss big companies and I would call them idiots. That's actually, in my experience, not true. And talking to a lot of people, sometimes it's, it's false. They are idiots. But sometimes um, operating, like if you're around good operators, just like a good employee at a big company, they can be significantly better operators. And a lot of the things that we make fun of, bureaucracy, meetings, things like that, that creates redundancy. And if you do it correct, redundancy creates... Um, predictability and predictability creates value and that's why your anxiety goes down and so a lot of that big company stuff a lot of it's bullshit a lot of it's really necessary and the people inside those companies can actually operate things really really well do you agree with that um i agree that that's true i wouldn't say that that's the main value the main value that i saw inside of a big company was that when you're big um you have usually two things. One is distribution. So yeah. you could take something that doesn't have a lot of distribution and give it more distribution. Or you could simply say, I don't really need to innovate. Let all these other people innovate. And I'll just follow because I have size. And so when I have size, I don't need speed. Right. Um, and so it's like a sumo wrestler versus, a, you know, a, a sprinter or like a, a you know, a, a, a lightweight, you know, a, a lightweight wrestler or something like that. And so you basically trade that distribution and size for, for speed. I think that's the, the first thing and, um, very hard to have both. Um, and you know, the, the, when you're at a startup, the expense, uh, the mistakes are very expensive. 
But when you're at a, uh, sorry, when you're at a startup, the mistakes are not expensive. Like, I don't know how many things you did at the hustle that were like dumb or stupid or whatever. And just like roll it back. Um, you know, at the beginning, especially, you know, whatever. I don't have any customers anyways. I don't have much revenue to lose anyways. I don't have a reputation to be burned. The press is not watching me. Uh, Twitter doesn't care what I do. Whereas when you're big, then your every move matters and every mistake is quite expensive. Um, and so you have to be a little more careful. And so careful is not a bug. It's a feature when it's a big company. And so I, I started to appreciate that. They're not slow because they're stupid. They're slow actually because they're smart because they don't need to go fast because they got size and ex mix, uh, mistakes are expensive. So they don't take, they don't try to make too many mistakes and, um, you know, by going too fast. And that brings me to my second to last point, which is a lot of cool shit that you and I like to make. You, you and I are zero to one people like uh, by definition, we're not the best at one to whatever. But a lot of the cool shit is completely illogical or really stupid. And a lot of the best stuff starts that way. This podcast, you called it My First Million. Pretty horrible name. Um, my thing was called The Hustle. Pretty bad name. And it was just a newsletter. That's kind of like not like when I pitch it to bigger companies, they go, this is stupid. This will never be big. And the reason why it existed anyway was because I was beholden to no one. We just said, man, whatever, screw it. We're just going to do it. When you're launching something within a big company, you have to have logic. You have to have reasoning. You have to like make a point because you have to justify it for someone to fund it. Uh, whereas when you're a nobody, just two guys, you say, man, screw it. We're just going to do this. We're going to have an anti-Black Friday sale where we charge more this Friday as opposed to right. less. And it, just because, just because we want to, because this is funny. It's completely illogical and illogical stuff works. Not all the time, and sometimes. When I was hanging out with the 70-year-old the person, I was explaining. I said, yeah, I'm thinking about what I want to do next. And, you know, I really want to pick a good project. And I want to pick a right, the right way to spend my time. Um, and he goes, uh, picking is hard. And he goes, and the hard thing about picking is that today she might look like a pimply, chubby person you know here but 12 months from now as you take that idea you start dating it and then you kind of pivot over here you change one thing get a new wardrobe all of a sudden she's 120 pounds she's, you know <laughs> she's uh, got her phd and she just got word in the mail she's inheriting 72 million dollars and he's like uh, <laughs> he gave me this analogy and he goes that's the problem with picking is that the best things don't always look like the best things up front this goes back to a Peter Thiel saying, which is the best ideas are things that sound like bad ideas, but are actually good ideas. And um, why? Because those things have the least competition. Those things are the least done. Those things have the highest upside because they're the most greenfield. Uh, things that are obviously good ideas are, are super competitive. Things that are actually bad ideas, doesn't matter how hard you work, they're bad ideas. So the sweet spot is something that sounds like a bad idea, but is actually a good idea. And that's, you know, this guy put it in a, uh, you know, you know, a, a different kind of analogy that I, I appreciated. And uh, I could, I'm glad I didn't, you know, say who, because, you know, people get mad about that analogy, but I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and That's I good. understood what he meant, which is, you know, when you started telling, when you started the hustle, you were like, oh, great. It's this conference. And I was like, you know, conference. Okay. Immediately, like a lot of work, you know, seasonal, yeah. doesn't get that big. Who cares? If your product oh, you can charge... get rained out, it's kind of not good. Yeah, yeah. You have $200 tickets to your conference. Like, all right, Sam, good luck. You know, and then you kind of fumbled and then you were like, oh, okay, conference is working, but you know, conference ain't where it's at. But I've been using content to drive ticket sales. Maybe I should just do this content thing through a newsletter. And then even that was still sort of pimply and didn't really a newsletter. I mean, uh, dude, people over here making flying cars and Uber and uh, you're doing a newsletter like get some ambition, bro. Like, you know, that, that can't be big possibly, right? Like aren't newsletters just like a personal thing people send out to their 50 friends and you kind of figured it out as you go. And then now people are like, yeah, how many freaking, I want to build the next hustle, you know, hustle for X, you know, how many people pitch you that myself included milk road was a, a hustle copy yet after I made fun of you for the, for doing a newsletter back in the day, I was like, you know, I didn't invest in your thing. Cause I was like, I don't think that's going to get huge. Right? right. And I was like, but you knew something, you figured something out along the way that was not obvious up front. And by the way, the hustle is very close to crossing 3 million subscribers. And that brings me to my last point, which is 
planning is something that I had never done. Like when people were talking about OKRs, which is like a framework for running your company, they would put it on a quarterly scale. And I'm like, yeah, how about a weekly? How about a weekly one? So we could like every single day, we're going to create something new. And that's really important for starting out. And I don't think you should plan too much. Right. Um, you call it worry about A, B, Z, uh, yeah. which is, I, I actually came, we, we both uh, separately had like the same thing where I'm like, I care about steps one and steps two. And then like, I'll worry about step, I think about step 10 as inspiration, but I don't worry about three, four and five. Yeah. Um, and so that's important when starting stuff. But when, I don't know when that point is, maybe 10 million, 100 million in revenue. I don't know what it is, but planning is needed. It's necessary and it's incredibly important. And that's what big companies do really well, or they try to do it well. And as I'm growing my new thing, I'm trying to like bake this in of like planning and not worrying about like uh, looking like, like, you know, I could have like a quarterly plan. It's okay. I could, I could even have like a six month plan. I remember when we were selling the hustle, we sold when we were around four years old and they wanted like a five year projection. And I'm like, what? Like, uh, that, 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 that's not even like, I, I can't even comprehend five years. I don't even know yeah, if I'm going to be interested in this. Yeah. <laughs> Form of these nuts. What are you talking yeah. about? Like, yeah. <laughs> you, you want me to write down a lie? Yeah. <laughs> My lies was, are verbal. There's no paper trail. You're trying to get me to write this down? Dude, it was ridiculous. And now I understand, like, it's actually okay to, like, kind of have some of these plans. So anyway... That's my list of things that I've learned, like being like seeing the buyer's um, perspective just a little bit. And I was just curious if you had any insights. It might be too early yet. Well, let me tell you the different things that they've done. So first, they hired a bunch of people. We were running the thing with basically three or four people and then one one freelancer, right? Like it was very, very lean. They, you know, basically one dude wrote the email every day and then me or Ben edited it. And that was like, that's how the, the, the whole product, the whole product was basically created by that. Now there's like a second writer, there's an editor, there's a head of content. It's like, well, who, who are all these people? What are they doing? Uh, is, the, is the content getting better? I'm not sure. Right. Like, but it, they've hired up people, which like you said, builds redundancy. Cause if the main guy got sick, which happened a couple of times, it was like red, wow. you know, red alert. Yeah. Um, you know, if we got a fact wrong, it's like, oh, I, I didn't have time to check it. You know, like, you know, we didn't, we didn't have those things in place. And so, you know, I think they've, they've basically taken, I would just say in general, they took a longer term view. They were like, okay, we're going to be doing this for a number of years. So what do we need to get to this point two years from now? And let's start taking those steps today where I was like, all right, next month, what would be sweet? Yeah. You're like, <laughs> you know, I'm just, that, well, cause you're like in survival planning exercise. You're I in have, survival I have, mode. I had a, even if it was, it was a survival mode. Cause it was like, okay, we got the business working. It would be like, I just wanted every day to be a new adventure. And like, that's not how these people think when they are like long-term oriented, they want each day to not be an adventure. They want each day to be like, you know, it's the difference between, you know, um, you know, people who go for these like long hikes and, uh, you know, a sprinter and like, you know, I was just more of a sprinter. And so literally our goal planning, we would say like, what's the minimum thing that would feel like a win. We call it a good win. Oh, that was good. And then what's the F yeah win where we would be like, F yeah, dude, we did ABC, right? That happened. And that's, and we, that would create our goal. And then we would shoot for the F yeah. And we'd make sure we don't miss the good. Um, and like, that's what we did every single month. And it was a little bit more. Um, and if we didn't hit it, it was a problem. Like I immediately was like soul searching, like everybody stop and let's figure out Who do like, I where fire? we've gone wrong. I'm ready to change every, anything and everything, which is not always the right approach. Sometimes it is right. Like these things serve you. And then sometimes they hurt you. And so I would say these guys, they put more money into growth. They hired more people and they don't panic. <laughs> There's the three differences between us. Uh, and I think their approach has some bad things. And I have, think it has some great things. And we'll see, you know, how it all plays out now. I think I read somewhere where someone was like, I was reading some like thing about masculinity and like the difference between a man and a boy and like a, a real man doesn't let like lots of different uh, or doesn't let like shallow input change his emotions and change his plans. And I remember mm -hmm. when I was running my company, I would always get emotional. I'm like, no, man, if I got to be a man, I got to like be calm and I can't panic. And I used to think like, oh, no, it was cool to be like Mark Zuckerberg and see and go, go in and see, oh, this isn't right. You're fucking fired. It's like, no, real men don't do that. You know, they could like they don't panic and they don't freak out. And that kind of changed my perspective on that a little bit.
yeah, my trainer, he's been teaching me this. He's like, okay, so like, you know, you're doing a set. So you're, you're bench, you're bench pressing or whatever. And let's say you picked a weight that the first, you know, three reps, four reps are easy. The next four reps are getting harder. And then the last three, four reps, let's say you're going to 12, uh, the last four reps, you're like, you know, it's kind of shaky and you want a spot, but more than anything, I don't know for you, but for me, it was always like, get to the end. It's yeah. like, I want to, I don't want to quit. I don't want to quit. I want to get there. But like, I would start rushing. And when you rush, your form changes. And when you rush, you don't actually have that time under tension that actually Look builds the you. muscle. Wow. Time T-U-T. under tension. Yeah. Or t- and so he's, That's uh, classic, classic muscle building words. I like it. Don't make me say glycogen. So, <laughs> so he's like, um, he's like those last four reps, you're trying to get them done. But that's where all the, all the gains are in that, that last bit. And he's like, that's where I want you to show poise slow and actually slow it down. Like, don't just like do normal speed, go even slower than your, your normal pace was to maximize what you get out of it. And so then that became, it's like, okay, when you feel that sizzle, when you feel that burn, that's the reaction is not panic and rush it's poise. So I took that. I was like, okay, that's the lesson in the gym, but the gym is just the metaphor for life. So now I'm doing that same thing everywhere. As soon as I feel that sizzle and that burn, and I just want to get out of it, I want to get done with it. I'm like, no, no, no. Now's the time to be poised and slow it down. And so that's been working wonders in the business world. Cause it's like, just when everybody thinks shit's hitting the fan, I'm like, all right, this is the time where we, where we, where we go poised, we lock in and we calmly address the situation versus trying to react, overreact and react to a, to a, a stimulus. This, my friend, is called growth, Sean. You are experiencing <laughs> growth. Congratulations. You're doing it right in front of all of our eyes and in our ears. You are showing growth. What topic you want to do next? We're in a um, weird right, middle. We got five We're, minutes. Yeah. Let's do, um, do you have anything little? Let me see if I got something little. By the way, while you're looking, you have to tell me 